wanted to do was talk a little bit about DBT implementation um, because I know a lot of you guys are either actively involved in something with, that involves DBT or you're hearing about it or people suggesting they include it or you're thinking about including it or one of eight million different permutations because DBT seems to be coming up quite a lot in the public sector. So one thing I want to say as my caveat before I start is that what I'm going to um, work on is you guys knowing about DBT rather than knowing DBT. Um, as I usually point out to people, the DBT manual is 500 pages. I can't possibly cover all of it. So I'm, I'm going to cover some points where I'm going to literally put up a slide that says, and there are these strategies, just so that you know there's kind of strategies, but I'm actually not going to teach them to you. So I want to sort of say that up front because otherwise we'd be here for two days and uh, fall of uh, seminar, which if anybody wants to take, you really want to know DBT, come take the seminar with Sarah. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to do a little overview of um, what we talk about in DBT as comprehensive, integrated, and informed DBT because I think this language really helps to sort of talk. You know, the more we kind of use this language, the more we kind of uh, can explain what we're doing, what other people are doing. Um, we're talking about the modes and functions of comprehensive DBT, which is the key issue for adapting DBT to other settings. Uh, some key elements in DBT that I'm afraid if you don't have, you don't have the treatment, you're probably not going to have much effect. Um, how we train in DBT and then how DBT implementation can go bad. So like what are all the things you want to know about ahead of time and not repeat the mistakes of everything else. So, um, so there's three ways to implement DBT. The standard is what we call comprehensive DBT. So by comprehensive we mean you've just got the whole thing. So you've got all the structure, you've got all the principles, you've got all the strategies, you're trying to do the whole thing to adherence. Um, integrated DBT is what is the language that we've started talking about when we talk about having specific elements of DBT that are integrated into another treatment. So FIT is one of the, I think, better examples of this, where there was no intention when DBT was brought into with multi FIT is a com combination of multisystemic therapy, DBT, and some uh, uh, addiction interventions. And there was never a plan when FIT came together to do a comprehensive DBT program. The idea was to take certain aspects of DBT that would be helpful and integrate them into an existing intervention. Um, and the idea is that whatever strategies you're using, you're using adherently to DBT, but you're not trying to do the whole thing. There's some um, exposure models that have done this where they've tried to reduce the number of people excluded from prolonged exposure by expanding the, um, uh, using strategies that allow them to bring in people where there's some suicidality on board, some treatment interfering behavior on board, so they're, they're trying to kind of bring in some specific strategies. And then what we're all trying not to do is DBT informed, which is using elements of DBT in a non-adherent way. Just throwing up a group and doing the DBT skills but not using any of the DBT principles or strategies in how you teach the skills, which believe me, it's a DBT skills group run in a DBT way, it's very different than just teaching the DBT skills. There's a whole, you know, it's, it's just about as the adherent skill for the group and the individual is essentially the same skill. So if you don't know the whole treatment, you won't be adherent in group, and I really do think it makes a big difference. Uh, so, uh, so the DBT modes, by mode we mean like the way the therapy is delivered. So individual therapy is a mode, group skills training is a mode, uh, the, the team where the therapists are meeting is a mode, so uh, phone calls are a mode, it's, the, it's the, met, the method of delivering the intervention. So a standard outpatient model, so this is what you find in the manual, is weekly individual therapy, Weekly skills training group, usually two and a half hours, um, with about a 20 minute break in the middle. Um, uh, consultation team meeting, so that means all of the, the, the people who provide direct service to the patients, either as skills trainers, as individual therapists, or as coaches, if that's a separate role within your, your team, meeting together every week, um, usually between one and two hours. Um, phone consultation to the client as needed, um, and we could talk a little bit about sort of the observing limits issue that people usually talk about with this. But the principle is at all, you know, that there's no arbitrary limits as to when they can reach you. It's just your, your own personal limits as a therapist. So, you know, in my case, my page is always on. For other people, that's not the case. But the idea is that we've got to have some way for patients to call us, get help, 
in between sessions. And then in a standard model, like what the research has mostly been done on and in the manual, outside of the DBT is inpatient, pharmacotherapy, family interventions, and other treatments. Now in other interventions, some of these may be integrated into the team. So we've had periods at Carverview where our pharmacotherapy has been part of the team. We've had a DBT uh, psychiatrist who was actively using DBT principles in terms of their um, prescribing, their interactions with the patients, and so that person was fully on our team. At the moment now, we have a psychiatrist who's not a DBT psychiatrist, so they're auxiliary to the team. So all of these, um, you know, in adolescent DBT, the family is interventions are much more integrated. So that, but this is kind of the research model. But it became pretty clear very early on, especially when Cornell's inpatient unit, which this is the mid to late 80s, so this is when inpatient in New York was six months, uh, with you know, no, that wouldn't be a surprise to be in for that long. <laughs> um, they were calling Marsha, and other people were calling Marsha and saying, you know, we want to do DBT, and they were trying to do essentially this in a hospital. And that wasn't necessarily making a very good use of the hospital. So uh, essentially what Marcia developed is this idea of functions of the treatment. What are the functions, what are the purposes the treatment has to achieve? So uh, the first thing you have to do is be sure that the treatment is enhancing the, the capabilities of the client. So the basic assumption is the clients do not have the skill sets that they need to get, to get better. So unlike something like uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is much more oriented on the idea that the person has the skills they need, but they don't have the, 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 the experiential avoidance is essentially blocking their capacity to function, from a DBT point of view, we're saying they truly don't have the skills they need. So any treatment in DBT must enhance their skills. The second function is improving the motivation of the client for treatment and long-term goals. So as a behaviorist, it's important to remember that uh, everybody's motivated, right? So from a behavioral, it's a behavioral treatment, so everybody's motivated, but what are they motivated for? They're often motivated to avoid pain, right? They're motivated to avoid struggle. Um, they're motivated to uh, get help for things they can't do for themselves. And those things often create more trouble, not less trouble. So the idea is that something has to motivate the patient for treatment, so to participate in the treatment, and they have to motivate them for their long-term goals. So with my uh, project that I'm doing uh, with the child and family residential system in Connecticut, usually the kid's goal is to get the hell out of whatever they're <laughs> in, <laughs> which is great. And I am all for that goal. And that goal is a whole lot better than beating up the kid down the hall. Um, and uh, you know, uh, just sort of mo being motivated to just take the easy road at every turn. Uh, and, and so that's a really important goal, uh, function of the treatment. You also have got to assure generalization to home, school, sports, activities, peers, work, every other setting. So in DBT, the principle is whatever you learn, if it's not getting out into their real, the real world, if they can't manage it independently in the places they need to be, you're getting nowhere. Um, having really skillful therapy patients or really skillful residential home patients is not the goal of DBT. Um, so you have to have some way to do that. And in DBT, these are what we consider the, the functions that directly impact the patient. Um, then there's two other functions where you treat the patient by treating somebody else. One is called structuring the environment. So the idea is that you, you're going to structure the environment surrounding the patient so that they will be motivated uh, for treatment and long-term goals. So one thing is direct intervention with family and friends. This is much more of an issue for the um, young adult, adolescent, child population. Um, left much less of an issue for us in the adult system. Uh, and also interventions with other treatment providers or social services. Um, one of the things that's very important is dealing with risk management of your own facility, <coughs> making sure that your own facilities, rules, structures, and guidelines don't in fact support the illness rather than support the treatment.